this uh, topic of big data was by far, I think, the most challenging. Mm -hmm. Trying to figure out how to take something as abstract as the planet growing a nervous system and trying to take National Geographic style mm -hmm. photographs of it was really difficult. We had a team of about 22 researchers mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we, what we didn't want was what people would expect to see in a book like this, which is data servers and people sitting in front of computers. We're trying to show how this is affecting our parents and our children and our it's day to day life. How does it amplify our ability to uh, to get things done, or fall in love, or make money, or solve a problem, or come up with a new you know solution to a problem? I think the theme that we saw that kept emerging as we did the book was this idea of instead of firing a shotgun off in the sky and hoping you hit a bird, mm -hmm. is using information to let you target so that you use your uh, resources much more efficiently. Mm -hmm. That sounds very cold, but when you see, you know, one of the stories I love and hear the most is um, um, Intel and General Electric are working on a series of products aimed at aging in place. Mm -hmm. My mom's 90 years old, and so I'm very concerned about her safety and her health, and she started falling a couple of years ago. So I was fascinated to hear that General Electric and GE are working on a carpet called the Magic Carpet, mm -hmm. and you install it in the home of your loved one, and it doesn't say good or bad, it doesn't say this is, um, uh, it, 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 it basically says this is, this is the norm for Rick's mother. Like on, it just watches her for a week and creates a baseline. It says, this is the time of day she touches the carpet in the morning. This is how fast she walks. This is her balance. And then two days before she falls, before she falls, the carpet says, you know what? Your mom's balance is different. She's moving more slowly. Or it says, it's 11 in the morning, and the pattern says your mom usually has touched this carpet at 9.30 on the way to the kitchen, and she hasn't touched it. So instead of um, cameras invading her privacy, basically, it basically sends me a message and says, you should call mom. Uh, so I, I love that idea of using technology to make our parents safer. Uh, there's another story on the other side of the spectrum, which is about babies. Um, babies born in preemie units, in, in premature baby you know, units in hospitals, they put a little fetal, fetal heart monitor on them, and it says the baby's okay, or no, the baby's not okay, everybody coming, comes rushing into the, into the ICU. Um, they actually looked at babies after they left the uh, preemie unit, and some of the babies had health problems later on. They went back to the data, mm -hmm. and they found there was a pattern they could detect from the heartbeats that no one was paying any attention to that could predict which babies were gonna have health problems later and which babies were okay. And what was really interesting, it was the babies with the regular heartbeats that actually had the problems, which is, you know, I, I know nothing about any of this, but as a journalist, I found that interesting. It turns out when you have a low-level infection, mm -hmm. the heartbeat regulates. In babies, it's very, very erratic. I also think that 2013 is exactly where the internet was in 1993. I think we were just hearing about cyberspace and the, the mm -hmm. digital highway and nobody quite knew what it was and some people said, well, you know, it's always, it's always interesting to me every time there's a new technology, um, the naysayers, you always hear, oh, it's just, it's terrible, the sky is falling and I remember people saying the internet was just a, a better way to deliver pornography. It's like, yeah, I guess it was good at that, but it turned out to be good at some other things too, right? So I, I think the big data is at that stage now where everyone's kind of groping around trying to figure out what is it, what does it mean, who's going to control it? And, and I think that the one of the things that I think is really important and one of the things that I hope I was able to share with the audience here was um, there's a gentleman who has a, a wireless pacemaker. So uh, it regulates his heart and it transmits his data to his doctor, uh, and through this company that makes the pacemaker. So he decided to track his progress. He, he decided to track his sleep, his exercise, his, uh, his diet, and he wanted to correlate that against when his pacemaker kicked in. Mm -hmm. So he called the company that made the pacemaker and said, could I get six months of the data you've been collecting about my heart? And they said, sorry, so th that's our proprietary data. And he said, wait a second, this is my heart. You've been, this is my, I want the data about my own heart. And they said, they won't give it to him. So that's an interesting story in and of itself, but it sort of speaks to this larger issue of, well, who owns our data, right? Why is it that we're generating all this data with our smartphones, uh, with our credit card transactions, our, our browser histories? Everyone's making money in trading in our data, and we have almost no say over who gets it, what they do with it, who profits from it. I think we're at that stage where it's in the, we're, we're like in the caveman era of big data. And my concern right now is that most of the people thinking about big data are large companies and uh, governments Those who, are already using it for who see huge potential. Mm -hmm. 
And I th I'm worried that a lot of decisions are being made and things are being put in place that are going to be really hard to undo mm -hmm. if we're not all part of this conversation. So I went to EMC um, and I asked them if they would give me the resources to send hundreds of journalists around the world and, and do this book. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, you have no editorial input or control. You won't see the book till it comes out. And to their credit, they said, just make it interesting. Yeah. And uh, then I went to FedEx and I said, I want to deliver on one day all over the world, you know, 10,000 copies of this book mm -hmm. to world leaders, to Fortune 500 CEOs, to Olympic winners and athletes. And I wanted, I'm trying to spark a global conversation now at the very beginning of this, because I really think it's really essential that people just, oh, that it has nothing to do with me. Well, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, it's just, it's, it's something for those, you know, the nerds to work on, the geeks. Mm -hmm. And I, it's gonna, I think this is gonna be a thousand times more influential on our lives than the internet. We all, the internet is pretty powerful. Yeah. I mean, we especially know when the internet is powerful when it doesn't work for five minutes. <laughs> and we all have withdrawal symptoms. Literally about 18 months ago, it seemed like every conversation I was overhearing or having with people, this phrase big data kept cropping up. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I ran to Marissa Meyer uh, at, uh, at TED last year, and we started talking and she said, you know, you should really do a book about big data. I said, you know, what is it though? It just sounds, again, it sounds like one of those kind of either marketing phrases or something that, that, that I'm not, I couldn't program my way out of a paper bag. So, and she said, no, and she said, we're watching the planet growing a nervous system. And I said, what? And she said, all of this, all this ability to sense what's happening all over the planet in real time, it's almost like watching single-celled organisms suddenly start developing you know, a brain. And she said, it sounds like a metaphor, but it's really happening. It's like we're able to now not only measure things, but analyze them and then respond to them while they're still happening. And as a species, we've never had that before. I mean, imagine if you're crossing the street and all the information you have about where the cards are is five minutes out of date. It's really dangerous. And it seems like so many of our problems, so many of the problems that humanity's facing come from that uh, disconnect between cause and, uh, 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 cause and effect, right? And, and you, know, you put your finger on the stove and if you don't know for six months you burnt your finger, was it the stove? Was it the cat you pet? Was it the news? I mean, you don't really know. And now we suddenly have this feedback loop that's closed for the first time. I'm really inspired. I, I think that I think we're all going to look back on 2013 as the year that everything started to change. Um, I, I think this is very hopeful. I think there's lots of creepy things and scary things, and that's always true of any new technology. I think we have to be really cautious about privacy, about the misuse of this data. I've heard stories, and I don't know if they're you know urban myths or not, but I've been I've heard that uh, that banks, at least in the United States, when you apply for a bank loan, will try to access your Facebook page, and if you listen to rap music, they will lower your credit score. It's like my 12-year-old daughter listens to rap music. Mm -hmm. What worries me is that there are there's some programmer somewhere who decided this was a clever thing to do to protect the bank, and w there's no laws or regulations that that um, control who's writing algorithms, yet these are, you know, if you think about it, algorithms are like laws, mm -hmm. right? But there's no elected officials. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I am concerned about that aspect of it, that, that things are being put in place that we don't even know about. I mean, when, if I get a bad credit rating, I can ask the credit bureau for a list of all the things that they believe that I've done that would make my credit rating go down. Oh, you didn't pay this credit card. I look at that, I don't even have that credit card. You've got somebody else, I can clear up my credit record. But when people are writing algorithms and no one knows what that, what, even what that thing does, all of a sudden it spits out a result, mm -hmm. that frightens me. So I, that's the misuse of data. Mm -hmm. But I think for the most part, in health, there's a wonderful um, story. Uh, Francis Collins, who's the head of the National Institute mm -hmm. for Health in the United States, uh, was telling us at TED Med last year that large pharmaceutical companies invent cures for human diseases. Mm -hmm. And then when they get into clinical trials, they find that a tiny percentage of people are, instead of being cured by that, like 99% of the people would be cured, but 1% would be adversely affected or, or killed by it. So obviously they can never release that drug, even though they know 99% of the people have that, that illness would be cured or at least helped by it. Now, because of genetic sequencing and being able to, to basically sequence our DNA at increasingly lower and lower and lower costs, they're going to very soon be able to figure out that you would be saved by this drug and I would be killed by it, that means suddenly, I mean, the drugs are there, they're sitting on the shelf, they're gathering dust. And I think, wow, just that's so exciting to think you can use data to suddenly, hopefully, help a tremendous number of people around the world with various you know, illnesses.